Compared to the short human age, trees can be considered immortal, just like islands in the oceans of time. They could tell much by looking into their past, thus recreating the events of their long lives. They became witness to global historical changes and the transformation of epochs. Try delving into the depths of centuries. Imagine that the whole life of a lonely oak tree is passing in front of you and go on a sojourn through a history of many centuries. This is about a thousand-year-old oak tree of Taras Shevchenko in Cherkasy region. The history of this oak tree most likely started in a dense oak forest that covered the hills and lowlands of the picturesque expanses of the land of Zvinihorod a thousand years ago. One of the few acorns under the leaves released a taproot, which became its main support of the tree. To live that long and resist natural elements, the historical oak tree had to get a foothold. Struck by lightning more than once, it survived and it has many legends. Trees are the witnesses of our history, of real historical events associated with many famous historical figures. They bear the genetic code of the nation. Therefore, our task is the preservation of such old trees, of which there are very few left. By and large, if you take a look at the expanses of our Ukraine, there are as many as dozen 1,000-year-old trees, and that is already a positive sign. The Burishchansky oak has seen a lot in its life. It became a witness of a vivid and tragic story and difficult trials that fell on the shoulders of the young Taras Shevchenko. Coming to the oak tree, the young poet shared not only his sufferings, but also entrusted the mighty giant with his most precious things, his drawings, that he did in the hollow of the tree. His rare gift manifested itself back when he was a child. It's as if the nature itself, enchanting and touching, created favorable conditions for this. The poor serf boy was inspired by the picturesque expanses of Zvenihorod lands. They are close to the geographical center of Ukraine and to streams of the eternal and immortal Ross River, a tributary of the Dnipro River. In these places, groves and oak tree forests, gullies and ravines, valleys and ponds are united in a fabulous weaving. Signs of the Chernyakhiv culture and burials of that era, as well as traces of Scythians and Sarmatians, were found on the territory of Morinci and on the outskirts of the village. The first mention of the settlement of Morinci dates back to 1648, although, according to historians, it appeared 200 to 300 years earlier. In general, the names of the settlements were given depending on what crafts the inhabitants were engaged in. The name Morinci is from the expression Moritib Jill, or smoke out bees, which is how people extracted wild honey in the woods. They first smoked the bees out and then took the honey. At the time, it was the main trade not just in Morinci but also in the neighboring settlements Karelivka and Budishchi. These lands, along with the young Taras Shevchenko, walked many times, were constantly mentioned in his works. The future Kobzar was the third child in his family. His parents then temporarily moved to Karelivka, to an empty house in Morinci, next to their grandfather's hut. It was in the backwoods near a deep and densely overgrown ravine and the Morinci pond. 
When they returned to Karelivka, they bought a house for 200 rubles, where Shevchenko's childhood passed. He drew his artistic and poetic inspiration from there. He was inspired by the endless expanses of those wonderful places and the nearby villages that were totally surrounded by greenery and gardens. The house of Shevchenko's parents, surrounded by a magnificent garden, reminds one of the everyday life of Ukrainian serfs in the early 19th century, when the hard labor under the system of serfdom and tilling the land to feed a large family did not interfere with the need and obligation to keep one's house tidy and cozy for the family and guests in the neighborhood. This is the restored house of Taras Shevchenko's parents. It is a typical Ukrainian rural hut, where food was cooked in the oven in the early morning and the children played and slept on warm cots. Every week the hut was whitened with white clay on the inside and outside. In the summer the floor was covered with fresh grass, which was replaced every Saturday. In winter it was covered in yellow clay, and then straw was on top of the clay for a place to sleep. The peasants wore clean and well-ironed shirts on holidays and when they went to church. They used a special appliance for this purpose. Slightly wet linen was wound onto a rolling pin and rolled with a mangle. That's how they ironed clothing in the olden days. Ukrainian peasants decorated their huts with handmade crafts. These were matanka dolls and straw horses for the kids to play with. And something more serious cut from wood, for example, could become useful in everyday life and give rise to a craft tradition. Such materials are still being used today by modern craftsmen when they start making sculptures or other crafts from solid wood. Maybe a Cossack or some other stylized character. I don't strive for authenticity in order that everything would be absolutely perfect. There's some kind of ornament here, but I'm not exactly sure. I don't know what my imagination will lead to. After all, nature itself has already done its job. Zorkin's works are manifestations of spontaneous emotions and of the first impressions of what he saw. It is not in his character to think long over the image he's creating. Instead, he skillfully observes and follows what nature offers. A pattern on the cut of a tree, gnarls, cracks, regrown branches, seemingly individual parts become part of a whole composition or features of a Cossack ride in his hands. Shooting from the hip, seemingly with no effort, a Slavic image is being created. <laughs> And what could be better? This is where we came from, and this is what we learned and inherited from our ancestors. It is close to the heart. Thus I create what I want in one breath. Oak is easy to cut, and it shows the end result almost immediately. If you cut poplar, there is a fleecy fiber and there is none of that highlight. But with oak, it ends up being what you want it to be. The craftsman does not wait for inspiration, does not plan his work and does not always know what the end result is going to be, since, as he says, he starts some kind of grand project. He is interested in large-scale projects. That is exactly how the 5-meter perun and the 4-meter boat dug out of oak wood appeared. You can keep dreaming and looking for inspiration while doing nothing, but it is better to grab a chisel and show people what you want to convey to them. At the same time, you must listen to the words of ancestors, their wisdom and traditions. Such experience help one to avoid making wrong decisions, resist the elements and prevent illnesses. People in these places have been cured thanks to their knowledge of medicinal herbs since the ancient times. But identifying them and understanding what ailment they cure is not enough. Each plant has its own time of ripening and accordingly harvesting. Most medicinal herbs are more effective if they are picked during the flowering season. Some come out before sunrise with dew, while others bloom later in a dry meadow. Phases of the moon and sun also affect the strength and energy of herbs. For almost a week, from July 21st to July 25th, this is the high time for herbalists to pick plants, while during the summer solstice, the herbs gain maximum strength and energy. 
можно собирать и листья и траву. It can pick not only flowers, as leaves and roots can also cure a person from ailments. In case of inula, we wait until autumn or the end of summer. While it no longer blooms, all of its healing power remains in the root. There is also a herb that is used as a tonic and a medicine. It is called the Rose Bay Willow Herb, which has been proven to have no contraindications. Our ancestors used to enjoy this libation long before the advent of black tea, brewing it in dried or fermented form. Fermentation is not an easy process. You have to twist the leaves so hard to the point that they start seeping juice. They used to do this by hand, but modern technologies have shown to be quite more progressive. Then we put these tubes into the jar for six to seven hours, barely covering it with a lid. The process of fermentation begins, and then I determine the readiness of this libation by the smell. If the flavor is very rich, then it is definitely time for drying it. The healing capacities of Rose Bay Willow Herb are endless. Brewed in small quantities, it provides a calming effect for the human central nervous system and the gastrointestinal tract. Equally beneficial is the process of picking herbs, walking barefoot in the morning, feeling the dew, and enjoying unity with nature. One can count on a surge of strength and health. Coming into contact with nature and forest trees, people have long found protection, peace of mind, and treatment of many ailments. Young Taras Shevchenko often came to the Budishchansky Oak, obviously not realizing it himself, in order to strengthen his spirit and gain vitality. Shevchenko was going through a difficult period at the time. He became an orphan and lost his home. So he shared his loneliness with an equally abandoned old oak tree in the summer residence of the landowner Engelhardt. When guests came to the estate, Taras had free time. He used to run to the old oak tree in the hollow on which he preserved his drawings. Back then, Shevchenko only dreamt of becoming a genuine artist, but he had already started getting orders for his works from Engelhardt. In addition to the paintings, Shevchenko's first works, which are now a national heritage, the preserved furniture from the landowner estate also creates the atmosphere of that era. It was restored and relined, but the mahogany, chisel decorations and the sofa decorated with polished nuts are original and still remind of the history of 200 years ago, as well as those three ancient oak trees growing in the park of Engelhardt's summer manor in Budishchi. Time did not spare them and left an indelible mark. Now they look like a unique landscape, where there are gullies, caves, peaks of hills and plains. Some parts of the landscape are still filled with life, while others look as barren as miniature deserts and salt marshes. The oaks are not as strong as they used to be, like they say, strong as an oak. All the more that they are a thousand years old, just like people, they lose their immunity to the difficulties of nature and life. In a thousand years, this giant has survived more than one thunderstorms and lightning strikes. Some wounds can no longer heal, and the huge thorough hollow in the center of the tree trunk will remain forever. Only humans can save and shelter it from rain and wind, and protect it from lightning and diseases. This oak tree has been serving and healing people for 1,000 years, and now the time has come for people to pay their dues. The hollows in the oak tree will have to be sealed with its own bark. Access to the oak trunk should be limited, and the soil must not be compacted further.
the inexhaustible desire of grateful descendants to bow to the old oak tree and touch the history of the great Kabzar is not as harmless as it seems. The soil gets compacted under the feet of countless sightseers, further complicating the already difficult breathing and saturation with water and nutrients of the old oak. Saving it from rain, snow, various pests and diseases, a roof was built over the tree. Dry and excess branches were pruned in order to balance the load on the tree trunk. While pruning, you must ensure that the wounds are minimal. A large branch with a diameter of about 40 to 50 centimeters might snap under heavy gusts of wind, and the wounds won't heal after the branches are trimmed, thus creating a hollow. Like any old man, the oak tree needs support and props. The skeleton of the tree also has to be reinforced without restricting its freedom of movement. The supports must be arranged in such a way that the branches that rest on them have a soft base. A tree is a dynamic system. It sways under gusts of wind, it grows, and it eventually changes its outer appearance. Shevchenko's Budishansky oak tree is the calling card of this manor and the entire Cherkasy region. It attracts special attention, and significant efforts are being made to preserve it. Even though the world around this old tree has changed beyond recognition, it still continues following its natural laws. Being a thousand years old, it became a living connection with our past. Compared with our fleeting lives, this oak tree seems truly immortal. Just like before, in the autumn, it will bear a harvest of acorns. That is the beginning of a new life, which will become the start of the next 1,000-year history of this wonderful old, old tree. <laughs>